Hello and welcome back to Chatbot on Robot Republic with me, Josh Oriku. Today we are joined by another really amazing special guest because I am here with Matt from Mamiji Studios. Hi, Matt. Hello. How are you? Good, good. I'm uh, very American today. <laughs> I was going to say, pre-interview, we were talking about where you live and stuff, and it was kind of like discussing that we're both in very small parts of our country, which is quite fun. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to be talking about your amazing game, uh, Video Game Fables, which uh, we love here at Robot Republic. Um, a couple of us have kind of been able to play chunks of it and stuff, uh, and it is really, really fun. Uh, so I suppose my first question really is, where did the inspiration from Video Game Fables come from? Yeah, so I came from a lot of like different sources because, like you, I'm a big RPG fan. I've been playing RPGs since I was a kid. Um, you know, I've always made RPGs. Like that's like my main thing that I make, uh, and that's like my main thing I play too. Yeah. So I would say like specific, more specific inspirations were stuff like Paper Mario. That's a very big inspiration. Like I was part of the uh, Paperverse, which is a really cool group. I don't know if you are you familiar with that. I've heard of it. Yeah, it's a it's yeah. a group of game devs, and they do like a yearly direct uh, paperverse direct where they have like a bunch of like paper they call them like paper Mario adjacent games. Like they don't yeah. have to be just like straight up Paper Mario. Um, so yeah, Paper Mario is a big inspiration. Um, stuff like Earthbound, I've loved Earthbound since I was a kid. It's just so weird, and yeah, that it's... fits me perfectly. You know, I'm just very very weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, stuff like uh, newer stuff, you know, like obviously like Undertale, like that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And then, so those are like kind of like the inspirations for the humor, the kind of the vibe of it. Yeah. But then it does take inspirations in terms of like what it's kind of like satirizing. Um, mm. So like a lot of inspiration from like, you'll see a lot of references to like Dragon Quest or like Final Fantasy, mm. um, some Mario games. Like there's a lot of, so you have like the inspiration for the actual vibe of the game. And then you have inspirations for the background of the world, which is this like kind of a stereotypical RPG game world that everything goes completely off the rails. So you have kind of like the two separate inspirations for the game, yeah. in a sense. I think that's one of the things that really came across, because I know initially when I started playing it, I was like, oh, it's kind of, it's got like this, the standard RPG vibe of whatnot. And then within about 10 minutes, I was like, oh, wait, no, we flipped this on his head and we are making fun of this. And it is, <laughs> we'll get to the kind of the narrative of the writing of the comedy and stuff in a minute, because it is genuinely brilliant. And I kind of like, in my notes, I've got, I was like, it's, it felt like a bit of a breath of fresh air because it doesn't take itself overly seriously. It is kind of, like you say, it's kind of satirizing the kind of standard RPG story formula and narrative formula and stuff. Um, but what I want to talk about first was this really cool kind of specific 3D pixel art style for the game. So obviously you mentioned uh, Earthbound and Undertale and Paper mm -hmm. Mario being kind of like big inspirations. And stuff. How did you choose that the kind of 3D pixel art stuff? Because it's something that you don't tend to it's not as common as say you kind of stand a 2d pixel art or you kind of 3d blocky games and stuff how did you choose that because it's really cool yeah um a big inspiration for that was like 3d dot game heroes which is one of the first games i played at least um i know it's probably more before that they use like a voxel style yeah uh and then it started to become more popular after that um i also wanted to make something that felt different but also familiar so you know you look at it and it's like i don't know I'm sure there is. I'm 100% you know, sure somewhere there is with how many games are, but I don't know of any other game that does kind of that character style where it's like a, it's a, I call, I call it a 3D sprite. Like that's why I named it in all my files and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's a 3D sprite because it's like they, they're flat, but they're not completely flat. Like you see, like, you know, Aru turns sideways in the prison to go through the bars. Yeah. Like you see her from the side and she has some depth to her, you know? Um, but it's not a voxel because a voxel is actually like a 3D, it has like, uh, yeah. layers to the depth and stuff but this is just they basically have two it's basically like two layers of blocks yeah and makes like a, a 3d sprite um but yeah i just want to make something kind of different something you don't really see very much because you know it's a lot of pixel art games with simple visual styles a lot of pixel art games with complex visual styles there's a lot of 3d games a lot of voxel games um so i want to make something stand out a little bit um and i think it does somewhat uh and then my kind of goal with the art style of the characters was I wanted to make, uh, I kind of wanted to do like challenge myself and say, how can I make these characters expressive as possible, but make them as simple as possible? Yeah. So like you'll see they look very simple on the surface, but once you see them in, in motion, they're a little more complex than you might think they're going to be. Like you think they're going to be very, very simple 
um, animation and stuff. But then you see they have some mobility. They have some mobility in their arms or nubs, whatever you want to call them, the little, yeah. little nuggets on the side there. Um, you know, they have facial expressions in terms of their eyes move around, their eyes change size, their mouths move. You know, I wanted to say basically – let me challenge myself and make very simplistic looking characters, but make them as expressive as possible. Yeah. And I think that was one of the things that kind of I found when I was in this short kind of you know period of time that I was able to play the game and stuff. The thing that really jumped out to me was not only this really kind of different, really, it was a really nice art style. I really liked the art style. Thank you. Um, but the complexities of the animation, because animating is a pain in any mm -hmm. game engine. Or yeah. even if you're even if you're using kind of like things like uh, Blender and Maya and stuff, it's a it's a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. But the the animations of that were kind of on the characters, especially when you were kind of like look at the thing that got me was that early bit where the princess kind of just kind of goes, "I'm stuck in a prison," and she goes, "Oh wait, no, I'm not," and then kind of shuffles through the bars. That had me creasing. Um, <laughs> but then some of the other things that were later on in the game, some of the animations and stuff, I was like, they look so smooth and so fluid. Like Thank just you. it it boggled the mind how that something that was pixel arty looked like it was I, in my notes I've literally just got this looks like a standard JRPG in terms of animation because Thank the you. movement is so, you're welcome because it really they're so fluid and so well done um and it just it was always kind of like I just that was one of the things for me I was just kind of like you've got because obviously normally what I was expecting was the kind of Minecraft kind of like robotic block movement kind of things but mm -hmm. you didn't it was just this you had like it almost seemed like the little nubbins the little nuggets that were moving around were connected to other bits of their bodies during... yeah so it's actually pretty interesting and also from like you know more like the game design side for you mm -hmm. um what I actually did was the body parts are separate objects completely um, so they have like it's it's kind of a complex structure like the act because uh, I use Unity I'm not sure how familiar with Unity you are, um, oh, but the, yeah, um, the the structure is pretty complex. You have like this, you, it's just like layers on layers on layers for each character. Mm. Like you have the, I call it like an actor on top that was like the movement and stuff like that. And you have this 3D sprite mm. object, and under that it has uh, everything's kind of parented into different like objects. Yeah. You have the arms are separate objects. The head is kind of a separate object that can rotate and stuff. The the eyes are separate. The mouth is separate. The feet are separate. So, like, they are very simple, but it's broken up into smaller parts that do have mobility on their own, but they're also connected at the same time. Wow, that is really, really cool. And thank you for kind of going into that level of detail, because I know there are people that watch the show and are interested in games design and mm -hmm. stuff and kind yeah. of sit there and be like, oh, that's how that's how they did it. Um, Which is really cool, so thank you. And, yeah, I kind of, I, in my head, I'm just imagining the kind of the actor at the top and then all the levels underneath it. Mm -hmm. And, you yeah, know, when you're working it's... in anything in unity you tend to have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff yeah and it gets it's it's like a huge stair step basically yeah. <laughs> oh awesome um so the game itself is it's it is an, it's an rp it's a really really fun rpg with some really great humor um and a really interesting battle system um did you always intend or were the intentions to always have it as a kind of the stereotypical old school turn-based rpg <laughs> Yeah, um, so one thing from the start, I wanted to make a turn-based RPG um, and keep it a turn-based RPG, but make it more fun. Um, because a lot of the issues people have with turn-based RPGs... So I have this theory that a lot of people think they don't like turn-based RPGs, um, but what they actually don't like is a lot of the conventions that come with most turn-based RPG games. Um, and I think uh, an example of that was Persona 5, because when Persona 5 kind of hit main mainstream, there's so many people I know personally, so many people yeah. that I know online, who never played turn-based RPGs. They didn't said they didn't like turn-based RPGs, but they love playing Persona 5. And so my, I think the number one issue for people is the speed. Um, yeah. And that's kind of what I broke it down when I was kind of going through this in my head and kind of doing some research and stuff. I think the speed is the biggest issue, because you know, you play, you know, you and me are both the RPG fans. We know a lot of times, you know, especially older games, you sit through long animations. There's like just wait time for no reason between some attacks. Um, there's a lot of unnecessary downtime. There's a lot of unnecessarily long animations. There's a lot of unnecessarily long like you know damage numbers popping up and stuff like that. Um, you know, you look. It's it's a big problem with like especially Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. They're still doing this, and yeah. I know that's an issue I talk about a lot of people is it's so slow, and 
Pokemon Scarlet and Violet even slower than some of the some of the other games that came before it. They slowed it down. Like you sit there, you have a status effect on someone. It's going to be like, okay, they're going to do an attack. There's like a weird pause between. Then it's going to do like the poison damage. Then there's another weird pause, and it's just so yeah. slow. And I think that's what people don't like. I think the number one thing, and of course, there's people who just aren't going to like turn-based RPGs, and that's fine. Yeah. But like I said, my theory is a lot of people think they don't like it because they don't like a lot of the turn-based yeah. games because they don't do it well. Um, so I wanted to make something that was still a turn-based RPG at its core, um, but that fixed a lot of the issues people have. And the speed was the number one thing. So you notice like a lot of the animations are very fast. Yeah. There's no like downtime between... It's not like you hit someone and then it waits a little bit and then it goes. It's like it's like back to back to back animations. There's no pause yeah. time in between. Like you attack, you jump back to your spot very quickly, and immediately the next attack starts, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I tried to address the speed issue. Um, the other one is I tried to make it so it's pretty engaging. So it's not just that you can button mash your way through. Um so that comes with a lot of like the balancing that I tried to do. Mm. So uh, like what I did in the game was that levels don't do a lot for you. They give you about one stat point each level, and that doesn't do a whole lot for you. So you still have to pay attention in battles. You still have yeah. to think quick in battles. Um, and the timer system plays into that as well. You have to think. Uh, you have to think fast because you get a bonus if you make your decisions quickly. Um, and also the crit system, which is like you can only use your damage skills, for example, if you have a crit, mm. um, which is a resource for those who don't know. It's basically in most games, you know, you get a crit. It's just a critical hit on that attack. But in this game, uh, when you do basic attacks, you have a chance of getting a critical hit, which is like a resource you store that you can spend later on a skill to make it stronger. And you can only use attack skills with that. So that's the other thing I try to do in the battle system besides making it fast. I try to make it so you have to be engaged. You have to pay attention and do your basic attacks to get your crits. Then you use the crits on a uh, skill. Um, so those are two main things I did. Yeah. Um. But I wanted to keep it a turn-based RPG, and I thought about. I actually had some mechanics in there early on. <clears throat> I was testing them, doing some like Paper Mario style, like timed attack hits, and yeah. I actually decided to take them out. Um, which you know some people probably would say that you should have kept it in, but um, that's just the decision I made. I said I'm gonna take this out because I still want it to be a turn-based RPG. Like I want the skill to be strategizing and thinking fast and understanding yeah. your party and your characters, not so much just hitting a button because um and like some people it's fine some people will argue that I should have kept it in and that's fine that's just an opinion um but in the end I did want it to be a turn based rpg and kind of yeah. innovate as much as I could on the turn based rpg genre yeah i don't think that really came across it was one, one of the things that i really enjoyed when i was playing it was the combat because obviously you know like you say you know we we both love jrpgs and stuff but they do mm -hmm. i mean i remember playing the other year when they did the remaster of final fantasy 8 which controversial opinion is my favorite final fantasy game don't at me um is i just it was so slow playing it nowadays and i think my big the biggest problem as well was obviously we were waiting for seven remake and that came out and it was like oh this is painfully slow and it's yeah. like you say it's the wind-ups and the animations and again i think i know people who were like i'm not a fan of you know i don't you know they were like oh i don't like tempered rpg that's a pokemon game and then they played persona 5 and they were like maybe i do like tempered rpgs but they've yeah, got to be it, like because it was fast fantastic. and it was yeah. fun, yeah. Fast paced, banging soundtrack, really cool stylization, all mm -hmm. these other things. And I think that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about this. When I was the combat elements of it and the timeline of a top, like you say, kind of like had you kind of on top, so you had to be a little bit more strategic. I found that in some battles, I wasn't I, initially. I was going down the whole kind of like old school Final Fantasy route of just attack, 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 mm -hmm. attack, and then I was like, I died. Yeah. <laughs> I like, what? I died. And then I was like, oh, okay, let's actually pay attention. And I found the combat, when you actually paid attention, because it does require you to pay attention, mm. the game is a lot more rewarding and fun. Because you don't kind of like go into that screensaver auto attack mode. You have yep. to be a little bit more on the ball with what you're doing and how you're attacking and stuff. And I thought that was a really nice way to approach the combat system. Um, and like you say, kind of like, you know, I can imagine from a design perspective, that must have taken ages to kind of like really refine that overall combat system down to what it is. Yeah, like I said, there was a lot of elements that I had like started experimenting with or that I cut out or that I decided not to add. Yeah. It was a lot of refinement down the road and just a lot of a lot of thought going into it and a lot of testing and a lot of thinking about like does this work, does this not work? Um there's there's other mechanics that I left out. There's other mechanics that were coded in and worked perfectly fine. Um mm. they're still in the code there. I just 
Just disabled it. <laughs> that off. Yeah. Um, yeah, it takes a lot to refine something like that and really get it to what you want it to be. And like I said, it's, you know, it's all opinion based. Some people won't like some of those decisions, but you know, when, when you're developing a game, it's like you do have to do a lot of refinement and get it to really fine tune yeah. to what you actually, what your vision is. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the most, having spoken to a lot of developers and stuff and having friends that work in the industry and having done dabbled myself, it is one of the worst things is once you've got a finished product and then you spend literally like twice the amount of time mm -hmm. refining and tweaking and altering yep. and editing and stuff and getting it, being like, is this good enough? No, it's not. Let's change that. Right. Let's remove that. Let's tweak mm -hmm. this. Let's... And then you sit there and go, is it good enough? Yeah. And I, from, from our perspective, yes, it was, because it was a bloody fun game and I loved it. Um, <laughs> um, as well, on top of the combat, one of the other things that I really enjoyed, and it does kind of, it flips the old school idea on its head. It's very kind of similar to the Persona thing, but you don't know what you're fighting. Is that you've, The quote unquote random encounters are still random encounters, but you don't, they're not random in the conventional sense. Mm -hmm. Because you have these quirky, purpley, bluey smoke blobs. And it's like, oh, what am I going to fight this time? And then it's like, oh, okay, I've never fought that before. Um, um, was that a kind of like a design choice early on? Did you kind of want the i the kind of did you was the intention to be like I want random encounters, but I also want players to be able to choose to do that kind of because obviously, you know, one of the worst things in the world is, for example, Pokemon when you're wanting to get from A to B. And every other step is a random encounter battle. And you're like, oh my God, I don't want to do this. I just want to get to the next town and stuff. Was that mm -hmm. a decision that you worked in? So you've still got this air of mystery around what you're fighting. Um, but actually giving players that choice to be, actually, to be like, actually, I want to press on with the story now. I've done enough battling. I've done some grinding. I've got some weapons and some items and stuff. I kind of want to move on. Yeah, um, that was a day one decision. Like, you know, we talked about a lot of decisions you tweak and refine, but that was kind of an easy decision from the first Hmm. when i started developing i immediately wanted uh visual i guess you call it like visual random encounters um yeah i think my first experience with that was zelda 2 where yeah. you have the little you know like you said little blobby things on the map and you can you know you can you can you don't exactly know what you're gonna fight um but you know you're gonna fight and you can kind of choose and sometimes you know they you'll fight when you don't want to like they might appear in front of you and get to you quickly and you know uh, kind of take you like catch you off guard. Yeah, but you still have more. You have control over whether you're fighting or not. And I think that was an important decision from day one. Pretty much, that wasn't a hard decision. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> but yeah, there there are some mechanics to there's some like underlying mechanics to the blobby things. Um, that aren't really explained in the game. Um, there's one thing that is explained in the game. It says in one of the tutorial things, it says there's a rumor that if you keep fighting battles without running away, you have a higher chance of getting those orange blobs. And what the orange blobs do is they give you a higher loot drop rate from enemies. It's like double the loot drop rate. Wow. Um, yeah, so there's stuff in the background like that. And one thing that I didn't really explain in tutorials is kind of a secret mechanic is if you keep uh, ducking the blobs, like if you keep dodging the blobs that when they come out, they get faster um, and there's more likely for more of them to appear. So it is kind of a thing where if you keep avoiding fights, yeah, technically and theoretically, you could always avoid fights, but there's a higher chance that they're going to snatch yeah. you and they're going to come out and quickly get you. So there are some underlying mechanics to that, yeah, as well. That's a really cool mechanic, actually. The idea that actually, if you decide to do the pacifist run, the game gets... so It's it's, a, it's similar to the Undertale thing when you try to do the pacifist run. Yeah, it is. It's, it's really hard. But actually, mm -hmm. to kind of do that based on enemy encounters and actually to just mm -hmm. increase the number and the speed of them is quite a cool way to kind of like almost say to players maybe you should do some battling because maybe yeah. you get your ass kicked later on if you don't sort of thing so it kind of works as a kind of like mm -hmm. onboarding and support thing whilst yeah. also kind of being to say to players pacifist run is going to be real hard in this game yeah and there was a there was a balance i had to take with like experience points in the game um and we can talk about the xp system more but uh the main thing about i did with the balancing is i tried to make it so uh, I did some different stuff with levels. So, like, you know, the XP system is basically where you get XP and it's kind of like a pool of resources, mm. of points that you can spend on your character builds as opposed to just, like, you level up. Um, it's a resource that you can choose to point it to a party level, which just levels up all your characters. Um, you can put It costs XP to equip equipment, uh, to equip skills, and you can always reallocate it. Like, you can always uh, put down your level if you need to use some of the XP. You can always <clears throat> unequip something or unequip a skill. 
Um, and the hard thing to balance about that, you know, you get in this issue where it's like, well, how do you make it so levels mean something, but they also, you can't just grind your way out of a situation. So I did a lot. That was one thing that took me the most refining, and I think yeah. it ended up pretty well. Um, <clears throat> basically, how levels work in the game is levels don't do much for you on their on their own. They add one stat point for each stat. That's all they do, and that's not a whole lot in the game. Um, <clears throat> what does make a big difference in fighting is uh, the equipment that you have. So when you get like a, like to a new tier of weapons or something, that's going to be where you notice you're doing a lot better in a fight and you feel better equipped for the next area. Yeah. But what I did is I made it so you have to be a certain level to equip that equipment. Um, and I think that ended up being a good way to balance it out where you couldn't just grind your way out of a situation. Yeah. Because you could get you could gain like 30 levels and you're still not going to be that much stronger but you equip a new piece of equipment and you're going to be a lot stronger but that has that level requirement so i kind of i, I did a bunch of testing i did a bunch of like statistics now so i would just do runs and do a bunch of like math and yeah. i had spreadsheets and everything and i kind of figured out like um i asked for some advice in like a game dev reddit or something like that and they said on their experience the average is in rpgs people fight about 70 percent of battles <clears throat> so I did some like external data research, research. I did some internal data research. Um, and it's balanced pretty well to a point where if you fight most battles on on that you encounter on your way to your objectives, um, you're going to be, you're going to have enough XP to equip like the next tier weapons that you get. Yeah. And you're going to be pretty balanced. But you can't outgrind your way out of like a boss fight or something like that. That's a really, really cool. And actually, the, my next question was going to be about, around the kind of the XP system because one of the things that really from a design perspective and from a kind of like um balancing and player progression perspective and stuff the XP system is something that is really cool I I I loved this kind of like this system because like you say you can't you can't just grind and power level to get ahead because the XP is very much it's the it's a commodity that is incredibly important and you need to be very on the ball with how you spend it. I found myself well, honestly sitting there at points within the short chunk of it that I played being like, do I want to level up my party or do I want to equip more equipment? Mm -hmm. Or do I want to boost other <laughs> things? It was kind of that kind of like, do I want to boost stats? Do I want to do this? Do I do? And it was it became a little more like almost it le the level the le idea of leveling up almost became a mini game in and of itself. Yeah, exactly. Because you had yeah. to be a little bit more on the ball and I found myself kind of spending time being like no, I don't. I'm. I'm not going to go with a level up. I'm going to go with some more equipment because actually that's going to have potential more better impacts down the line. And I found myself kind of almost kind of like being a little bit more on the board. I was engaged a lot more with the leveling system in this than I was, say, um, the standard. You get a level up or your stats boost up. I think the last time I was disengaged with the leveling system was Final Fantasy Thirteen's Crystarium, where mm -hmm. you went up levels and you could pick the route around the tiers you went and stuff. And I think that was the last time I was this engrossed in a leveling system because i was like oh i can spend points and boost stats or i can get new kind of like skills and stuff and i was like that was that's what this harkened back to for me i was like i'm really engaged in a leveling up process in a way i haven't been for a long time um, yeah and like i said i think an important part i wanted to do was make sure you can always take back your decisions you know that's yeah. that's the important thing with the xp system from the start was make sure people if they don't like a decision you just unspend it yeah. and you can always rearrange your party and that encourages it encourages like uh experimenting with your party build um it doesn't punish you for that because i know like there's some systems and games that aren't very friendly toward that like you know any any game where you have where you have to spend skill points for example like you know like final fantasy games yeah. like um final fantasy 5 or 3 where you have like a job system it, you know it kind of punishes you for yeah. experimenting because then you're you if you try a job or something and you don't like it then you just wasted a bunch of time leveling yeah. up and you can never get that time back you know you'd try to play around with red mage because it's like well this does a bit of black bit yeah of white magic and then you're like oh it <laughs> doesn't it's... get any of the good spells yeah okay. and then you just can't do anything in the end yeah yeah yeah, you yeah so it... out of dark because one of them and no black or white mage and you're like oh well we just wiped yeah <laughs> yeah so i want to respect the player's time and say like yeah. you know because a lot of these games are counterintuitive toward experimentation, which I think is always a bad thing. You yeah. should always be able to experiment. Yeah, and actually, I think that's kind of for me personally, someone who has spent to this point decades playing JRPGs and RPGs and stuff. Actually, that like I say, this the the level of the experience system in this game was when I was playing it. And it's a testament to how you kind of all of that time and effort that you must have spent on the balancing and the researching and the kind of like really fine tuning it and stuff. 
allow that flexibility was really quite interesting because I like you say I did spend a bit of time experimenting I kind of like initially I was like right level up level up level up and then I was like hold on let's level down a couple and let's see what else I can do with the experience points and see what that does and I was actually the combat became slightly easier because I had kind of like instead of just chucking everything on one stat point per level I was backing it back a bit and giving myself a bit more flexibility to play and like you say the ability to bring in other characters and kind of play around with builds and stuff is something that does kind of it makes it more entertaining you know no longer do you have to just have the kind of the stereotypical here is my healer and here is my tank mm-hmm. you can be a lot more flexible and I've, i really enjoyed that about the whole design process and stuff um but really interesting actually once we once we double the interview about picking your brains a bit more about that system because it sounds really awesome um sorry i'm proper geeking out over that <laughs> <laughs> i think it's a pretty safe space for geeking out right now oh, absolutely <laughs> um so kind of like thinking about then so the game has a really, really decent narrative. And like you said at the start, it's got this stereotypical JRPG, the kind of RPG narrative, but you kind of satirize it. And it results in some genuinely hilarious dialogue. I mean, like some proper laugh out loud dialogue moments from me when I was kind of you know, playing the small chunk of it that I played. Um, was it really important that you kind of had a game that match so a kind of game that kind of had this more jovial upbeat tone to match the kind of the overall aesthetic of the game because the game is it's very bright it's very colorful like we talked about the um the 3d pixel art kind of like um art style and stuff was it really important that you kind of had a narrative and overall tone that matched that kind of aesthetic because obviously like you know for example persona it's a beautifully stylized and it matches the, t- the tone of the game matches our stylization and the story and stuff all really, really well. And I kind of, that's the vibe I got from this is that you, your narrative and your story really match that. Was that important? Yeah, that was definitely important. Um, From the start, it was a, you know, a lot, of, a lot of those elements were actually from the very start of the game, you know, years and years and years ago when I started, like the, the style of the characters, um, kind of the aesthetic, the story of the world, just like a lot of that stuff was kind of a day one thing for me. And that was yeah. kind of where every, everything kind of sprouted out of that. Um, but yeah, so everything, I want everything to be cohesive in that sense of like the visuals reflect the story and the story reflects the the characters and all this kind of reflects each other and the sense of humor. So you kind of like look at it and you kind of know what you're getting. Um, you know, there's a lot of unexpected things you wouldn't expect, like, you know, some more heartfelt moments, especially, you know, near the end of the game and stuff like that. But you kind of know what you're getting when you look at it. But at the same time, you don't know what you're getting because a lot there's a lot of unexpected stuff. Like you, I think one thing is, um, I wanted to make a game that was satire, but that had its own identity, had its own world, its own yeah. story, and didn't just rely on satire. Because like you know, it's maybe a hot take, but I have a lot of problem with a lot of satire games because I think they're kind of lazy sometimes. Yeah. Um, where it's basically like, hey, remember this thing. And that's the joke. And it's kind of yeah. like, okay, well, did you actually tell a joke or did you just say, here's comedy. a reference to this thing? Like, yeah. So, like, anytime I have anything, it's just like a subtle reference or something. Like, like for example, Nate's cosplay shield, it's a, spe- it's a skill that increases defense. Um, <clears throat> and it says he uses, like, a cosplay shield to boost defense. And it's kind of modeled after, like, <clears throat> the Dragon Quest, like, Erdrich shield a little bit. Yeah. Like, it has a little bit of sex. And that's not, like... I don't like take that and say like here's a here's the joke. It's more just like kind of in the background. It's just something yeah. you say, oh, I might get that reference. Um, so I wanted to make sure like the identity of the world and like the a lot of the jokes and not all of them. Obviously, a lot of obviously there is some probably cheap jokes in there, but I wanted the sense of humor to be like a genuine sense of humor. I wanted the world to have its own identity, its own characters, its own uh, vibe, its own. Uh, lore and everything that isn't just hey remember this thing from this game yeah. and that's the whole joke you know I tried to put more effort and put more life into everything as opposed to just being a series of references back to yeah. back you know yeah absolutely and I think that was one of the things I did notice like I I found myself chuckling at some of the jokes but the <clears throat> the world is really interesting like some of the narrative points obviously we'll keep this as a spoiler for as possible some of the obviously we well, I haven't finished the game yet, um, unfortunately. Um, but you know, one of the big, big, big things that kind of came across was the fact that you had this one. There were these little incidental moments within the character, kind of like some of the dialogue and stuff, and some of the NPCs as well, the way they were designed, the way they interacted with you and stuff that were just I found really interesting and really quite light hearted and 
quite fun but like you say you know kind of i suppose this brings me on to my next question really kind of like the the narrative development of this game obviously you know it's an rpg i'm my assumption would be the kind of the narrative and the world building and everything was like kind of at the core early stages of the development process but kind of how did you go about that because there is so much stuff to uncover even in like the small couple of few hours that i've played there's a lot to explore there's a lot to uncover um how did you go about that i just i i have mind images in my mind of just hundreds and hundreds of spreadsheets and word documents and post-it notes and whatnot <clears throat> i mean you're not wrong yeah I, <laughs> that's basically what it is it was a lot of stressful stuff a lot of uh hard planning a lot of like you said spreadsheets a lot of word documents a lot of writing stuff out on paper yeah. um that was the hardest part for me probably was just like making the narrative and making the stuff i think i think one of the hard things for me was that you know and i'm I'm really I'm not great at like marketing stuff. So whenever people like ask me like explain your story in a couple words, I end up talking for like three hours. But um, one thing that's been hardest for me to explain and kind of get out there is that the world itself is a stereotypical RPG world, but the game that we play, the story that we play through, is not a that stereotypical RPG. Yeah. Um, and that's not been the hardest thing to explain for me because it's. And that, that was hard for me in the writing process because I basically had to make two narratives. I had to write yeah. two narratives on top of each other. The one narrative is what this game world used to be like, right? Yeah. Um, so I had to write the narrative of what this game world like. And it was a hero, you know, that a princess would get kidnapped. A hero would come and he would travel to the uh, and get the five prisms from these five guardians. And then it would unlock a bridge to the last boss. Yeah. Um, and then I had to kind of make the narrative that they had changed the RPG script to be that, um, you know, the, the actual RPG script of the world kind of changed at some point. And this is all happening before this game even starts. So I had to yeah. write these narratives on top of each other. So there's like a Lord of the world. And then when we're coming in, this is decades later, um, after, since the last time the, the world had a player, this is the last time who they call the deity, you know? Yeah. Um, so you're you're kind of seeing this game world where everything's kind of aged, like the characters have aged. They're a lot of them are kind of retired, a lot of them are out of shape, a lot of them are out of practice. You know, they're not used to doing this RPG script anymore, and that's where a lot of this narrative comes from. That's where a lot of the humor comes from. That's where a lot of the characters yeah. really shine. Is that um, now you're not you're not playing through that RPG script that this world is based in. You're playing through that RPG script going completely off the rails and bonkers yeah. and everything's going completely nuts, right? Um, because things are out, everyone's out of practice and everything's going wrong. Yeah. Um, so I had to write this lore for the world and what's happened in the past in this world. And then I had to write, how does that get completely screwed up? So I had to basically write something and then break it into, break it apart and destroy it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was very, very difficult. That was so difficult. Um, uh, but yeah, I, th I think it paid off because a lot of times what you see is, like I said, you see, for example, a lot of the like bosses from the old RPG script, a lot of them are like older now. Like there's this bird who used to be this really strong, like buff bird. And now he's like really out of shape and he like can barely walk and stuff. Um, and he still thinks he's like, he's like hot stuff. And then you have like, um, there's a, there was this like vicious, like, spider queen that was one of the bosses and now she's a grandma and you have to help her babysit her grandkids yeah. um and that's like part of the narrative in this so i had to kind of like write this background for everything and then write the story on top of it yeah um so that's where a lot of the unexpected stuff comes in too because most of the time you are going to visit like these old guardians of the old world and stuff but a lot of the times you're not actually like fighting them because like I said, they're, everyone's world is kind of an actor. Like, they're not actually, like, terrible, crazy monsters. They were just putting on a show for the most part. So a lot of times you're, like, going to their home or you're, like, helping them with something and then they're going to, yeah. like, give you what you need or help you out. So it's, I don't know, it, it was a pain. It was a pain, basically, is what I'm saying, so, to write yeah, all these things on top of each other. Yeah. Yeah. You've kind of, it's that whole kind of, like, I've written pages of text and actually the player only sees pages 80 to 100. Yeah, sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, and that, and actually, eighty to one hundred is actually both the most important and the least important part because actually, pages one to eighty are what should be, but pages eighty to one hundred are actually what you will get. Yeah, so it's kind of this idea, this kind of like dual layered branching kind of narrative sort of idea actually, and it's it's really fascinating. One of the things I genuinely kind of 
it was one of the things that I actually did find the most amusing about the game is that how everyone was like expecting it to be this is how it should be and the game and it was like but it's not quite working like that yeah and a lot of them are kind of stuck in that where that's all they've yeah. ever known so they don't know what to do now now that the script's thrown off they're just like kind of like paralyzed and they don't know what to do at this yeah. point has, it had very much that kind of like now what yeah kind of vibe to it it was like oh um hmm, now what mm -hmm. sort of thing and that's what i kind of felt going through it was it was a, a really 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 challenging kind of way to approach narrative though because obviously like you say kind of having to write basically what you've done if you've written the narrative for two games yeah for one game which yeah. is you know writing narratives for a game is an exhaustive practice in and of itself and having to do that twice for one game is mind-boggling um, especially when you factor in the fact that you know when you're working on narratives you have to go you go through so many iterations and so many edits and characters come and go and chunks get chucked out and rewritten and everything else i can imagine it just it, that must have taken forever yeah it was it was a process all the way through i mean yeah. there was stuff that i i i was fixing to the end of development or you know yeah. a year before the game release you know it was, oh, a, it was a pain <laughs> um so obviously you know we, we've touched on this a bit with the kind of like some of the you know the and it is but it's very much how the, this is kind of like where we get this kind of really good matching between the kind of the gameplay and the mechanics side of it and the narrative side of it because there are so many different types of mechanics and different kind of like aspects of games and stuff that are brought into the game because obviously you know you start playing it and you think initially right this is going to be a standard art turn-based rpg i fight things they die i get stronger i eventually power myself up find the MacGuffins, bit battle the bad guy but obviously because of the narrative <laughs> We don't necessarily do that. And as a result, you've got all these other little... I almost... In my notes, I've got... They're kind of like... Almost like mini-game-esque kind of things. But they're not. Because they're actually integral to the overall story of the game. It's not like the kind of like... The little mini-games you get in Kingdom Hearts 3. Which you just do for five minutes. Because you're bored and you want the achievement. Um, and how many of those kind of ideas... I think well, how many of the was that was was having these kind of like these kind of like all these instead of battling certain guardians instead of battling some of the bosses and stuff you did task like you know you helped the spider queen with her grandkids and stuff how many of those were kind of like really early conception this is what I want to do and this is the sort of things like instead of battling some of these big scary monsters actually because it's been so long you're going to help them with certain tasks was that kind of like from day dot and kind of how did you go about working and developing those as you were building and developing the game yeah, some of them were early and some of them were very late. Um, and a lot of them were done like out of order from when you actually encountered them in the game. Yeah. Um, I think one of the earliest, let's see, I think one of the earliest ones I had was the dragon. Um, there was a dragon named Death Rays who was one of the guardians and he was, you know, he had his dragon sword, which is like this uh, diamond mine. Um, and then you meet him in this game and like, I don't want to spoil much, but you know, you have to go to his place for something and you find out over time he's become like an actual hoarder hoarder. Like his dragon horde has become a horde. So now he just has this junky place that's just full of crap and um, you have to navigate through it. Uh, that was an, actually a very early one. That was an idea I had like, and a lot of this is just like stupid ideas that pop in my head, like stupid jokes that make myself laugh. I'll just be like, what if a dragon sword became a hoarder's horde yeah and i just like laughed at myself and said that's funny and then i wrote it down you know <laughs> that was like that was a very early one but there's some that were done like later um i'm trying to think of one that was done later um oh actually the the autumn forest i'm not sure if you did you get to the autumn forest yet i'm, not I think sure I, got there. I'm nearly there okay yeah so that uh you meet uh one of the guardians named pumpkin spice there mm. um and originally that's where the spider queen was going to be. So pumpkin spice came in later. Cause I decided I want the spider to be somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so pumpkin spice was a character I added to the fall, the autumn forest. Um, so that was an example of something that changed kind of later on where something kind of shifted around. I started shifting narratives around the different places of the world and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a mix, honestly, just like some were done yeah. day one thing. Some were very late in the game. Um, it's a big mix actually. Yeah, and I mean to be fair though, like with a, with such a kind of intensive, because I would imagine the whole development cycle for this must have been really really intensive. Um, and of actually sometimes moving away from one thing and working on a different thing. Like say, if you kind of have these ideas, you're like, oh, that made me chuckle. That can go in as a kind mm -hmm. of idea, kind of like you know, you will, I I don't know about you, but when I'm working on creative things, I'm kind of like, if I get that spark, I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. I'm gonna work on that. 
because that's yeah. interesting. Mary, right? that thing I'm working on at the moment is doing my head in, so I'm going to do a new thing, and then yeah. when I get bored of that, I'll go to the other thing. And I think that, yeah, and that and that workflow works for some people. Like it works okay for me, and you know, I'm assuming it works okay for you. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's just different. People are different. Yeah. Um, and one thing you mentioned, like the different mechanics in the game, and different like, uh, like I think one thing you know, if if you haven't been to the Autumn Forest, you haven't seen a lot of the like kind of more wacky stuff that happens in like like quote unquote dungeons. It's wacky stuff. Yeah, it's very wacky stuff. <laughs> um, the first dungeon is pretty straightforward. It's it's get through the dungeon. You have to avoid like the traps. It's like buzz saw. Yeah. It's like a very Bowser's Castle type level where. Um, which is interesting because the first dungeon in this game, kind of example of what I mean by things are different than the original narrative. The first dungeon in this game is the last dungeon of the original narrative. You're going to like the Bowser's castle right away. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then, so that's a pretty straightforward dungeon. That was kind of, that dungeon is kind of teach you the base game and kind of get you used to the game. And then it kind of goes crazy from there. Um, like the second dungeon's boss, you actually have, you have to do like platforming segments in the middle of the battle. Um, Basically, from the first dungeon forward, yeah. uh, every boss is going to have some kind of crazy mechanic that goes either layers on top of the base battle system or completely changes the battle system. So, I want, so like once you do the first dungeon, you're like, okay, I'm comfortable with the battle system, and the game is like, surprise, now you got to learn more stuff. System, yeah. Yeah. And then, like, um, you know, the Autumn Forest, you don't actually fight there. You go through like this cool, like, isometric, like, puzzle level type thing. And then. Uh, there's a boss where you have to do a third-person shooter in the middle of battle, and, you, and the battle's still happening in real time, and you got to switch back and forth. Um, there's one where you got to be careful of where you place your turns on the turn order. Like there's like certain things that'll happen. Like if uh, if you place a turn on a certain turn, you that turn gets canceled. Um, there's a kind of a kart racing mini game you have to do in yeah. one of the levels. So I tried to make it so it's like it's always something new and unexpected that you see. But there's always that core battle system at the core of the game. It's not like this boss is this boss is suddenly just a first person shooter boss or something like that. It's like yeah. no, you're gonna do that on top of the battle system. That is like the constant that flows throughout the game. Because that's core is a turn based RPG. Yeah. And that's really, really nice as well. I'm actually really excited to see some of the more wacky stuff as well. Like I know what I'm doing once with once we're done with the interview. I'm not gonna rush it by the way. Um but yeah, I've got to, got to jump back in and kind of like move through it and stuff. So expect an email in a few days being like, oh my God, I love this so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, next question is about um, the kind of, the, not just the music design, but like the, the overall sound and the music design. Because um, I, you know, obviously whilst I was playing the game and stuff, I found the sound, the kind of the general sound design, the audio and the music is really kind of like elevating the game's kind of like fun an exciting kind of like jovial vibe that we've already talked about um mm -hmm. when kind of like approaching and tackling the kind of sound and music design for the game how important was it to was it for you to ensure that kind of like the music because music can kind of like music is very personal to each person so how important was it to you to ensure that the music and the audio design kind of like linked and drew everything together like you know it worked with the narrative and the world design but it also worked with the mechanics and the battle systems and all the other things yeah that was very important um well, I'll say this. It was so important that I hired someone else to do it. Um, oh. So everything, everything I tried to do, I know it sounds like a lot to a lot of people, but kind of, I try to make it. I try to make everything as solo as possible until mm -hmm. I really need something. Um, so like my past projects, well done on solo. Um, I did everything else in video game fables except for the music. Um, it was so important to me that like, uh, I didn't want to spend you know years learning to write music and stuff. Um, it was important enough to me that I actually humbled myself and said, I'm going to get someone else to do this. Yeah. Um, the guy's name is uh, Lev C E G M. Um, he did an amazing job. I think, uh, I think how I found him, I think I just posted something on Twitter and this is back when I was just starting development and I didn't have many, I had like maybe like 200 followers, something like that. And now I've got like, you know, 1500, which is a lot, but you know, it's definitely a growth. You can see. Oh, absolutely. Um, so like at that point, like I didn't have many connections. I didn't have much networking at that point. Um, and I think I just put out a tweet and said, hey, I'm looking for uh, musicians for a game. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people, especially in the game industry, who are, like, desperate for work and they want to do something. So, like, they're looking at these 200 Twitter follower uh, people who are like me who are just these unknown devs. And they're like, I really want to work on a game. And it's hard to find work nowadays, you know. Yeah. Um, so I know how that is. It's 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 really hard to find work for yeah, almost anything nowadays. Yeah. That you're, especially in this, this industry. The, yeah, um, the industry is 
very challenging at the moment. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so it was it was amazing to me how many people, you know, and these really good musicians were reaching out to me, just this unknown developer. And it was really cool to me. Um, um, I guess that could, that could have come across. Wrong. I'm not saying they're like desperate and they're not yeah. good. I'm saying it's like they're, you can be really good and still struggle to find work. You know, I think it's that's the thing, though, isn't it? The yeah. industry, especially with the way the industry is at the moment diverging completely off of the topic for the actual mm -hmm. chatbot but the industry it is, it's so hard and there are so many talented people in the space who are trying to get jobs yeah and it's just unless you have experience in a big studio mm -hmm. you're not going to get the job but the irony is you can't get the experience in a big studio yeah unless they give you the job <laughs> yeah so it's a thing to let. yeah it's it's a big it's it's a genuine general kind of like problem within the industry itself at the moment i know that mm -hmm. there are some very big powerful people in the industry who are shouting about it and trying to change it and stuff at the moment as well mm -hmm. which is brilliant and it does need an overhaul but yeah i know what you mean it's kind of twitter is twitter is brilliant because like you say you've got so many people that are like i want to work in the industry i will work with you on this project or i will work mm -hmm. for you on this project for you know i will work and some people are like i will work for free i just want some yeah shit. i had yeah i had some people who said that um it's and i was gonna pay you know i was gonna pay whoever it was regardless whether yeah. they tried to free or not um but yeah so i just want to clarify i'm not saying they were like they're not good it's like yeah. there's really good yeah musicians there's really good i mean you know you get into it and say there's really good indie games that yeah don't get any attention or something like that too it's you know um, but yeah, so I, I, I did a feeler out. I think what happened before that is I did have a musician lined up. He was someone I had met. Uh, I can't remember how I met him. I met him at like a convention, a local convention or something. Mm. Um, and he ended up, uh, he ended up not being able to do the soundtrack. He was really going to do a soundtrack. I paid him and he did a few tracks. Um, mm. You can hear him on actually the original uh, trailer. Um, but he ended up not being able to do, do the job. So it wasn't anything wrong with him. He just had other stuff going on that mm. he had to do and he just ended up not being able to do it. And that's fine um so i was looking for someone else and like i said i got a bunch of i got a bunch of people reaching out to me which was really cool as just an unknown developer you know having these people reaching out yeah. and people were sending me uh their their portfolios you know they're sending me their rates and stuff like that and it was just it was a really cool experience because that was one of the first times i've had where i've actually like uh worked with someone else and like actually had to yeah. go through and be kind of a producer role and like figure that stuff out um and I don't think there's anyone that messaged me that I didn't enjoy their music. And like, yeah. I, I would tell you because I'm not going to name names. I would tell you yeah, there were some that weren't good, but it was genuinely just like all of them were just really good. Yeah. The problem was a lot of them just didn't fit. So like you're saying, like the music yeah. is very important in the narrative. A lot of them made like amazing, like Final Fantasy quality, like music yeah. and stuff like that. But it's like that just didn't really fit. So they're yeah. really good composers, but um, they just didn't really have the vibe I needed. Yeah. Um, and I think I had narrowed it down to like two or th I think it was like two or three people who like did have the vibe and they were really good at making that vibe that I wanted. Um, but I ended up going with him because uh, he just fit the vibe the most. And yeah. he's the one I gelled with the most when we were chatting and stuff like that. Um, so he did an amazing job. Uh, and it's important for anyone listening to know that the soundtrack is for sale on the Steam page as well. And you can even get a bundle and all of the profits for that go to him. Um, I don't wow. I don't take profits from that. Um, I want to make sure he got paid. I mean, I paid him up front, yeah. but also I want to make sure any soundtrack sales went to him. So, um, like I take some for taxes because I have to pay tax on it. Essentially, it's yeah. it's complicated the whole thing. But basically, he get he gets all the money from them. So please buy the soundtrack if you buy the game. Support him. He did an Absolutely. amazing job. And like there will said, be a direct link to the Steam page and a direct link to the soundtrack stuff as well. Awesome. In yeah. the description below, so that people yeah, like I said, grab that. grab the bundle. Also, when is this going to air? Do you know? Um, if everything goes to plan, let me check my calendar. Okay. This will be good because now people get to see behind the curtain. I feel like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> sorry, um... did I throw you off? <laughs> did I ruin the whole illusion? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. It's like don't look at the man. Don't look at the man behind the curtain. Yeah, just look over that, there at the giant floating head. Um, in theory, this should be dropping. It should now be if you are watching this live and I have done my job properly. Which, if you're a fan of a channel, is always a questionable thing um it should be <laughs> the 12th of february okay but right. it might be the 5th and it also might be the 19th so oh so completely so there's so like could a be three week span where it could be one of those sundays it will be within the next <laughs> within the next three weeks of the interview because obviously we're doing it now on the 31st of january um so 
if you are watching this, please do comment as well. Drop us a comment and be like, oh my God, it's this date. You did your job well. Or, oh my God, you did it a week earlier or a week <laughs> late. You absolute buffoon. Oh, no, um, explicit. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, I was I was just going to say it's on sale right now, uh, 50% off. So, But that's till February 6th, so it probably won't. Uh, if this drops on February the 5th, it's on sale. If it's not, yes. you're out of luck. Sorry. <laughs> Blame my editing skills. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, okay, so my next question then is, um, I kind of I tend to finish my interviews with the same two kind of general questions and stuff because obviously these are kind of like some of the big, 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 big things. Um, during the development of video game fables, what have been some of the biggest challenges you have faced? Obviously, we've talked about the kind of the, the obvious, the inherent ch challenges you had with writing this incredibly complex kind of multi layered narrative. But what have been some of your biggest challenges in terms of getting the game ready for getting the game ready to play, getting it out there in the world, etc.? Mm -hmm. Um, the biggest challenge, kind of more internally. Mm was uh like my mental health with this because i've always struggled with mental health since i was a kid i'm very open about that i talk about it all the time um yeah. so I've, I've always struggled with like uh anxiety and depression so like you can imagine all the stuff that comes or you, yeah. like, you don't have to imagine you know all the stuff that comes with making a game is like yeah. really draining so you know you have like the fact that i try to explain it to people who don't do this kind of thing i try to explain it. it's like imagine uh someone offers you a job right and they say hey, we don't know how much you're going to make from this job and we're going to pay you like four years from now and you, we have no idea how much we're going to pay you. But do you want to work for four years for free? <laughs> you know, and that's, that's what doing the indie game is. It's like you're taking up this opportunity where you have no idea how much money you're going to make from it. You don't know if it's going to be financially worth it. Yeah. You're going to be stressed and working basically a full-time job for no pay for years. And then you might make some money back at the end. You might not. Yeah. Um, so that was a main stressor for me because... Uh, uh, this whole time I've been basically working a part-time job um, with my brother. We make like software for local businesses and it pays pretty well, but it's, in, it's to a point where basically I just, I work just enough hours on that to pay my bills and I yeah. just like live humbly and use the rest of my time toward game development. Um, um, and I'm pretty like used to that lifestyle. It's not a big deal for me, but I know for a lot of people that would not be yeah. very good. So I think just the mental health side has been the hardest thing for me the whole time. Just that constant stress of like, Am I ever gonna finish this game? Like I like even now I can't believe I'm on the other side of release because yeah. for like four years I was just stressed all the time, feeling like it's never gonna get done because like, it feels like an impossible task. You look at how many things you have to do and how many things you still have to do, yeah. and it's like this is never gonna be finished. And it's still kind of like shocking for me when I think I'm on the other side of it, even though it's been what eight months or something like that. Yeah. Um, so just that. Just that constant stress. Oh, there, there goes Phoenix. Um, me too, Phoenix. Me too. Come here. Hey, come here. Are Phoenix, we getting a dog? Are we getting a special guest dog? Yeah, is she being a dog? Hold on. Oh my god, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Waiting for a dog is like the best thing ever. Sorry, she wants to be interviewed. She's being jealous right now. Oh bless her. Yeah, she can jump um, onto the interview. It's fine. <laughs> um yeah so i think just the hardest part of it was just the mental health side of it because i was just always stressed you know i'm working 40 plus hours a week um <laughs> uh i mean i'm I, you know i'm working basically full-time hours plus part-time job on the side for no pay i'm i'm poor yeah. poor as hell you know <laughs> it's it's a very stressful experience so my mental health was not good um i wasn't sleeping you know you know it's just not good um that was the hardest part for me and more, but more specifically, like on terms, of, like what was actually hard for the game. Um, I think the narrative was, cause we talked about that earlier, you know, I'm writing these yeah. narratives on top of each other, just like connecting the dots and figuring out how do they get from point A to point B and like what happens in between there. Like uh, another hard part was like doing the ending and stuff because you've got, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to laugh. It's just the dog's like, <laughs> no, sorry. it's like, yeah, I was going through hell. This is hilarious. Um, that's the puppy. I understand. Uh, <laughs> but yeah it was just a lot of it was hard just trying to figure out the narrative and just like yeah. the ending was super hard because you're committing to like this is how my game is going to end and i have a million ideas for how it can end you just got to pick one and go with it yeah um but in terms of like coding and stuff like i'm i'm programming is my specialty so like coding and stuff wasn't really hard for me like actually making something happen that i envisioned isn't too hard for me i can do that pretty efficiently yeah. but actually narrowing down and zeroing in on what i want to happen that was kind of the hard part for yeah. me 
Um, but the absolute hardest part for me for all this, besides like my mental health side of it, uh, is like the marketing side. Because I'm not good at marketing. I don't have experience with it. In my opinion, that's the hardest part of game development, especially as an indie developer, if you don't have a specialization in that. Because, you know, I'm doing everything. I'm doing, I'm making trailers. I'm doing interviews. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm reaching out to streamers and review sites and doing interviews and stuff. And then it's like, well, when do I have time to do development? Yeah. So that was really hard for me, especially like in the months before development, because, I mean, there were people, you know, you, the rule is you're supposed to get out you're supposed to get all your stuff before release. You're supposed to send all your keys out before release. There were thousands of people I was contacting and you know, you're rushing to get, make sure everything's ready to go for launch. And it's just like, I was still sending out uh, keys and press kits and stuff to sites months and months after release. Cause there just simply wasn't enough time for me to do it all by myself. It wasn't that I wasn't prepared or that I was, or I wasn't doing it correctly. It's I literally didn't have, there weren't enough, literal hours in a week yeah. for me to finish this game and also do all the uh, press and stuff I needed yeah. to do. So that was very hard for me. And even now it's like, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident in the product. I think it's a good game, but you know, with like the sales aren't great. It's just, it's hard to market as an indie developer, you know, you're yeah. releasing with like, I think it's like 6,000 games a year, like 10, no, it's like over 10,000. I think, I think it's about, I think the last time I looked, it was like ten and a half, eleven thousand, or something indie games a year. Yeah, and it's it might be so. So when you release, you're releasing. Now. Yeah, you're releasing with hundreds of games when mm. you release your game. So visibility is just hard. So it's you know it's a struggle. Um, and you know I'm still trying. I'm still still doing marketing, trying to work on my marketing skills, but it it's hard. That's the hardest part for me. Yeah. Because like I said, I do believe it's a good game. You know, I think reviews and stuff reflect that, but it's just getting it out there and getting yeah. people to see it. And I understand from a gamer point of view, I understand when you see a game that doesn't have much publicity and stuff, it's like, it's hard to pay attention to it because you've got hundreds of other games. It's like overstimulation. Yeah. So I don't even like, I'm not like blaming gamers. Like, I'm not mad that people aren't playing my game. It's like, I get it. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. I mean, we all, we've all seen the memes about having gaming backlogs that are yeah. longer than our tax returns exactly. nowadays. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, so so for me, it's hard as someone who doesn't have a lot of marketing yeah. skills how do I convince someone to buy my game when they have hundreds of games in their backlog and there's hundreds of games released every week? You know, and that's the hard, that's a big challenge as yeah. an indie developer. That's a big challenge. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, that's kind of like the marketing side of it has been, you know, I've, we've done quite a lot of these now on the channel. Um, mm -hmm. And actually like time and time again, people say it's, it's, it's raising awareness, it's marketing, it's getting mm -hmm. people to actually play the damn game mm -hmm. <laughs> that is the hardest thing yeah um, and i think well, i was gonna say like you know my game has a free demo and it's like i genuinely believe if i can get people to just like play the game yeah. i think most people will enjoy it and not everyone oh, will, obviously but it's just like getting people to actually take time to play it. it's it's so hard in this market yeah oh absolutely i mean but it is it is such a good game and it is thank you it's upbeat and it's fun and the combat system is actually really engaged for a turn-based game it's probably the most engaged i've ever been in a turn-based game i mean thank you you know if you want my opinions on pokemon scarlet and violet please do tune into the next series of pokemon smash or pass <laughs> with myself and t because we spend a whole 10 minutes of the first episode of season two discussing our problems with it um <laughs> but you know i the game is so good and if you're watching this video go and bloody download it click on the links in the description at the end of the video not now because you'll miss the last question um and go and bloody buy it because it's a bloody good game and it's really fun. Uh, yeah, like I said, there's... especially if you're an RPG fan. Oh my god, if you're an RPG fan, if if you're like an old school Final Fantasy or Pokemon or Dragon Quest or Persona fan, play this game because it is just really fun. I've said yeah, and I like I said, there's a, there's a free demo. It's a very generous demo. It lets you play from the very beginning of the game up through through first dungeon. So you're looking at like one to two hours of gameplay. Yeah. Um, go try it help support an indie developer it's made by i'm a big rpg nerd as evidenced by my you know like we talked about earlier my tattoos and my shirt and everything i'm a huge rpg nerd so it's made by an rpg nerd for rpg nerds i think it also has merit for people who don't usually like rpgs like we talked about earlier i yes i geared it toward rpg fans but like i also made it accessible and i've i've actually met a lot of people who said they don't like rpgs and they've actually really enjoyed this game so give it a try you know yeah absolutely give it a try um, my final question then, Matt, is 
I ask this on all of my interviews and stuff, and I get the the responses I get are mixed. Um, <clears throat> some people are like, "I'm having a break." Some people are like, "Oh yeah, no, we're doing DLC." But what is next? Um, yeah, both video game fables and does Mamiji Studios have any future projects planned at this point in time? Kind of what what it's the big what next question. Yeah, so I haven't actually had much time to take a break because, like I said, I've been doing. I was doing marketing for like. I was doing full time marketing for like three months at least after release. So I did I did try to take a little break the last couple of months. I've been trying to relax a little bit. Um, but I've also had to do work on like side projects to make actually make some money and actually be able to like exist in this world. Yeah. Um <laughs> uh but I actually Don't have worry. yeah, yeah. Um I did make DLC. It's called the Nightmare Arena that came out uh October like 25th or something i don't remember um, my brain's so frazzled but yeah so there is dlc it's like three bucks um it's a cool like battle arena thing where it's like basically it has a super boss and it's super challenging like it's a really really difficult thing so it's made for people who really want to dig into the battle system yeah um so definitely get that it's i, I believe there's a bundle on the steam page so get that as well um so that was that was kind of the like what's next and that was planned pretty early on um but so after that, I tried to kind of take a break, but I do. I did actually start my next project. Um, I'm working on it. I I, I haven't had time to work on it last month or so because I've had to do a contract that I signed up for and I had to finish a project for them. Mm. Um, but yeah, I have actually started. I told myself I was going to take a huge break, but I just I'm a creative person. My brain wouldn't let me do that. I couldn't yep. just like rest, unfortunately. Um, but it's uh, I in, I I've talked about a little bit on my Twitter just very briefly. So like. I can talk about publicly, but it's not video game fables related. Um, I mean, I'd love to make a sequel one day. You know, I kind of set it up that it could have a sequel. It doesn't have yeah. to. Um, I would love to one day, but like, you know, you have to look at it from a point of view of like, you know, this game isn't selling very well and it's done that much publicity out there. So it's like investing in a sequel probably isn't very smart for me right now. I need to yeah. kind of move on and do something else. I would love to one day. But yeah, so I've started working on a, uh, have you heard of Dokapon Kingdom? I've heard of it, yes. Yeah, so it's like a Mario Party ish style, like board game oh, cool. slash RPG type thing. Yeah. Um, it's one of those like friendship breaking games where you just like get super pissed at your friends when you're playing nice. with them and they're just like not your friends after that. Um yeah, it's kinda like a mix of like Mario Party with like a RPG. It's very fun, very frustrating. It's an older game came I had it on Wii, I think it was on PS2 as well, and it's like a series. I, think I remember but... the PS2 version. Yeah. And I it's also some very, very lengthy arguments with some friends over it, actually, if I'm remembering <laughs> the right game. Yeah, probably. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I love that game and I feel like it's an untapped market. Yeah. Um, where there's just not like these, there's not these like, I mean, it's, it's a competitive turn based RPG and it's like, yeah. what else has that? So I feel like it's a really big untapped market. I love the game. So I started working on like a kind of a spiritual successor to that game. Hmm. Um, I've actually got a lot of the code done. It's it's actually working pretty well. So it's going to be a lot of it from now on is going to be like actually fleshing out the mechanics of the game and like refining the code. But the codes like I I, I did that pretty quickly. I got a lot of the code done. Awesome. Um, it's going to be more about like getting visuals and stuff like that. But yeah, so it's like a Dokapon Kingdom style game. Um, it's going to be a game that's going to make you hate your friends. It's a nice multiplayer party RPG. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. Um, and actually. Just like a month ago or something, coincidentally, they announced they're porting Dokapon Kingdom to Switch. So yeah, there was some like, news. That it was late last year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it was like really weird timing. I was like, okay, this is kind of weird. Um, but actually, that could be good for me. You know, if if yeah. if that game actually does well, because like any game does well on Switch. Like there's games like you know you look at like Wii U games that didn't do well at all. Yeah. And they put them on Switch and they sell like hotcakes. So I was thinking like that's actually good for me because if if the game does well. Then there's gonna be a lot of like copycat games start coming out. People are like, "Wow, Dokapon Kingdom! Well, let me start making one." But I I already have a leg up. You're I already started game, yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I just fortunately just started that before I even knew they were reporting it. So, um, yeah. So I'm excited. Awesome. Yeah, I don't know how far it is off. I'm not setting any release dates. I'm not doing anything. I'm not. I'm barely even talking about it publicly. It's not like a huge secret. I'm just not like yeah. showing it because it it's it, it is an idea in the works. Yeah, and it's yeah. it's very functional. Like I have a functioning board game for the most part, and a functioning battle system. So. Um, nice. 
yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I've never done a multiplayer game. That's kind of I, I kind of told myself I want to make my next game be a multiplayer game because I always like to challenge myself yeah. and do something new. So look forward to that. Uh, keep it on your radar. Keep this unnamed game on your radar somehow. Right, Momiji Studios <sighs> party game on your board. I don't know. We're gonna have to get you back on when the game releases. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, Matt, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming yeah, on the thank show. Thank you. Um and please do, you know, kind of make sure you go and find this game on Steam. You know, like I say, there are links down in the description right now. Matt, my final final question, and I promise this is the actual last question. Um, where can our lovely viewership find more information about you, Bermiji Studios, and of course video game fables? Yeah, so um, you can go to my link tree. Uh, I think it's linktree.com slash video game fables. We'll make sure it goes <laughs> in the description. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter. That's like my most active social media. So find me on Twitter, Momiji Studios. And like like Josh said, it'll be in the description. But yeah, I'm most active on Twitter. So that's probably the best place to follow me. I do have a Discord. Um, I have a TikTok. I have a Facebook. Um, but yeah, Twitter's my most active. So you can find me on there. Awesome. Brilliant. And like I said, there is a link right now down in those comments. Uh, not down in the comments, down in the description even. God, do your job right, Josh. Flame neck. Um, <laughs> there is a link right now to the Steam page for Video Game Fables along with the direct link to a soundtrack which you can buy as well. And do download the soundtrack. The soundtrack is awesome and it fits the game so well and I love it. Um, and along with all of Matt and Mimiji Studios' uh, link tree information as well. Matt, it has been such a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate it. No worries. And we'll keep in touch. And to all of our lovely viewership, thank you very much for watching. Please do hit that like button, subscribe to Robot Republic for all of our content, and hit that bell icon to get notified of all of our new stuff. Uh, from me, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Matt. And we'll see you next time. Bye.